In this video, I'll be teaching you how to play the campaign of Kill Team Ashes of Faith. This is assuming you already know how to play Kill Team as a base name. The narrative campaign is comprised of several Kill Team matches combined with some new mechanics. So in this video, I'll be explaining the new mechanics and not the base name itself. This expansion is also able to be combined with the Spec Ops narrative rules from the core Kill Team book. That's completely optional, but if you want to learn how to play narrative Kill Team, I have a video on that which will be linked here and the end of this video. So let's get started on how to play Ashes of Faith. First of all, you will need everything you need to play regular Kill Team as well as these new components. A side note is you don't have to play with the Inquisitor in the Chaos Cult. It can be any two Kill Teams. But I'll be referencing Chaos and the Imperium here. Just swap that out for whichever teams you're using. So the new components you'll need are 15 Territory Cards, Six Territory Tiles, the Inquisitor deck, the Cult deck, nine Investigation Reward cards, your 15 Persuasion Benefit cards, and one Marker Sheet. Assuming you bought the Ashel set, those all should be in there. At this point, you'll want to set up your campaign board. You'll pick six territories to use. Either randomly draw them, or each player pits three. I'd lean towards randomly drawing them, personally. So set these aside and mark your territory tiles with the cards for each territory. If you're playing this across multiple sessions and want to store these tiles, you can use the corresponding markers to keep track of that. Each battle will take place in one of these territories and they all fetch the battle in different ways. And you'll be putting points and trackers on each one, so that's why you want to be able to track each one separately. Now each player gets a Control, a Persuade, and an Investigate card into their hand, and place the matching deck by you. At this point, you'll need to pick the missions you'll play throughout the game. You'll need at least five. You can do this by either making a big list and rolling off. You can pick them beforehand. Or even as you play, you can pick the missions that kind of match the narrative you're creating. It doesn't really matter which method you use, just make sure you and the person you're playing with agree on the method before you start. I personally will be creating a big list of missions, and then randomly rolling for them. In re-rolling, if I get one, we've already played. But that is just personal preference. So I personally like talking about how you win a game before actually going into the rules. That way, when I'm explaining the mechanics, you actually get why they matter. There are two different ways you're trying to win here. The first is control. The player who controls the most territories at the end of the campaign wins the control condition. Then, after you go through the campaign, you have one big final fight called the ritual mission and the player who wins that, wins that condition. So you can win one and lose the other, or you can win both. So now we're all set up and ready to actually start playing the game, so let's get started. Here's the campaign sequence. Each round you start off the battle stage, which is an actual kill team match. Then stage two is draft, where you get rewarded for how good or bad you did in the previous match. Stage three is scheme, where you play your resources that you gathered. And stage 4 is where you actually see what everybody did in stage 3 to see who has control and who's going to get bonuses for future rounds. And you'll play through this 6 times. Then you play a ritual battle. So let's go through those in more detail starting with stage 1, the battle stage. The first round of stage 1 will always be the same mission, and that is the cult revealed. If you have the book, it's page 29. But before you get started, you'll also want to pick what territory it's happening in. The Inquisitor player or the player who's using the Inquisitor deck will pick the territory for this mission. Then just play a regular match kill team using the territory rule and this mission. After this initial match, give the player who won the match one control point in the territory you played in. For every battle stage beyond round one, the player who controls the least number of territories will pick the territory you're fighting in. So it's a catch-up mechanic. And you cannot select the territory that you previously fought in the round before. You'll have to fight at another location before you return back to that territory. Then for the five rounds after the initial one, you'll play different missions. Like I stated before, this can be done in a variety of different ways that will be determined before the match. Once you know the territory and the mission, you'll play a match of kill team using these conditions. The only difference from a normal kill team match is that when you reach the select kill team portion of the game, which is kind of the pre-game part of kill team, you may select up to three persuasion benefits from the territories you control, if you have any. For round one, you won't. 
after the match, the winner will get one control point in that territory. To summarize that, stage one of each round will be selecting the territory, selecting the mission, playing the match a kill team, and giving the winner one control point. The next stage is the draft stage. Here is where you would get conspirators based on how well you did in the last match. Looking at this chart, reference how many victory points you have and put the reference number of conspirators into your hand. Add two ruse cards into your hand as well. These cards are meant to fake out your opponent because they're worthless, but your opponent doesn't know what you're playing. And you'll have them every single turn. So the number of cards in your hand is public knowledge, but what those cards are is totally secret. Also, there's no math on the hand size. Also during this step, make sure you have control of Persuade and an Investate card in your hand. You should have all three of these in your hand before you go to stage three. That stage is pretty simple, so now let's go to stage three, which is the Scheme stage. This is where you use your cards to try to win control or get benefits. You have three main types of cards in your hand that can get you points in the territories. You have Control, this is how you get control points besides your winning matches to try to actually win the game. Because the person you control the most territories wins the control victory condition. You also have Persuade. These give you persuasion points within a territory. If you're winning persuasion, then you can get benefits from it. And you can use up to three at once. These range from things like redeploying and changing orders for a third of your kill team, to getting two free command rerolls. Some of them are pretty powerful. Then you have Investigate. If you get 4 points of investigation, you get a one-time use card. These can do things like let you automatically win the initiative during a turning point, or heal an operative 3d3 wounds. Your other cards are your ruse cards, which are just fake outs. They have zero points. You can put them by themselves to make it look like you're trying to win an area, or you can combine them with your scheme cards to make it look like you're doing all-in on a territory to make your opponent overcommit. Then you have your Conspirator cards, which you get for playing the match and getting victory points. Each of your scheme cards are worth one point, and each of these cards are also worth one. But you can't play them by themselves, they have to be with a scheme. This will make more sense when we explain the next stage. So how you'll actually play the scheme stage is one at a time, starting with the player with more cards in their hand. You'll play one card from your hand onto one territory. If it's a draw for each card in the hand, the winner of the last match goes first. If that was a draw, you just roll off. If you don't want to play a card, you can just pass your turn. But if both players pass back to back, the stage is over. So you want to be careful doing this, and you don't want to give your opponent the chance to end the stage early. Also, your three main scheme cards, which are Control, Persuade, and Investigate, must be played in different territories. You can't play two in one area. They have to be spread out. When you play a card on the map, you pick one territory and play one card face down. This is called a bid. Then your opponent does the same thing until you both choose to pass. Since these are face down, your opponent has ruse cards. You'll have no idea how many points or what kind of cards your opponent is placing. You'll see that they have different cards in different territories, but you'll have to guess what they're trying to do. It's a lot like bluffing and trying to trick your opponent, kind of like poker. And remember, you can just hold on to your cards, so you don't have to play them. You can save them for future rounds. But you'll always get your main three ones back, so you don't feel like you have to save those. Now that you've both played all the cards you want to play, and both players have passed, we count the cards to see who gets what points in what territory. This starts stage four, which is the dominant stage. At this point, reveal all of your scheme cards that you played face down during the last stage. Remember that each scheme is worth one, and all conspirators are worth one, while ruses are worth zero. For each territory where a player placed a scheme card, add their points to the total in the tracker, and if they go over 10, place another marker here to represent the 10 points. For example, if the Chaos Cult already had 4 points in control on this territory from a previous round, and they played one control card and two conspirators, they gain an additional three points, making their total seven. Now that we've added up all the points, you can determine who has established dominance in each territory for each scheme. If you have dominance and control, it doesn't do anything until the end of the game. But getting these points will be how you win eventually, so don't ignore them. 
To determine dominance and persuade, it's the same thing. Most points win unless it's a tie. Then neither player has it if it's a tie. If you have persuade in a territory, take the persuade benefit card that matches that territory, and now you can use up to three of these per match. Remember, you declare this during the select a kill team phase of the battle sequence. Then we have investigate. Whichever player gets four points in a given territory gets an investigate reward card. If both players get four points during the same round, there is a method of tie-breaking. So whoever has the most investigate points wins. If that's a tie, it's whoever has investigated the least territories. I'm assuming this means whoever has finished investigations in the least territories, meaning you've actually gotten a card from it. Then it's whoever has the least persuade dominance, so whoever would have the least amount of benefits to choose from. Then it's whoever is controlling the least amount of territories. And then somehow, if you are tied on all of those, you roll off. Each territory can only produce one investigation card, so once one player gets it, the other can't. Meaning through the entire match, there can only ever be as many investigation cards as there are actual territories. When you win an investigation reward card, keep it secret. What you do is you draw three cards, keep one, and put the other two back on the bottom of the deck. Each reward card will have different rules for how to use it and what it does, but they're all one-time uses and you return them to the bottom of the deck after you use it. These do have another use outside of whatever they say on the card. You can play one per dominant stage, and if you do, subtract one point from any scheme category from your opponent. So the Games Workshop rules don't actually specify when this applies, like when it would go onto the stack. Like if you can use it after your opponent reveals their bids but before they trigger, or if it's before you reveal your bids. If you're using my video as a guide, I'd say do it after you reveal bids but before you update the point tracker. This can stop a player from winning an investation, and I think it's the most powerful use of the card. Since these are supposed to be pretty powerful cards that are difficult to get and you've put a lot of resources into it, I think you want them to be pretty strong. Whatever you do, just agree with your opponent beforehand, that way you know how it's going to actually play out. Another option you have during this phase is to sabotage. If you play an investigation card in a territory that has already been investigated, so not one of the reward cards, the actual scheme card, you can subtract one from your opponent's control or persuade in that territory. And this will only ever be one per stage. So even if you add conspirators with your investigate card, it doesn't change anything. Once again, Games Workshop doesn't actually give us instructions on when you take this point away. On the rules reference, it talks about sabotaging at the end of the phase. So I do it after all other points have been added. So that ends the campaign round. You do your initial round with slightly different rules for the first battle. Then you play through it five more times. At the end of this, you determine who wins the control victory. So obviously, the player who controls the most territory wins. If that's a tie, it's the player who has persuaded the most areas. If that's a draw, it's the player who has the most combined points in control and persuasion. And somehow if that's a tie, you both win. Now that we know who has the control victory, you play one final match for the ritual victory. The Chaos Cult player will try to perform one big ritual that can determine the fate in the planet. The Chaos player pits one territory to play in and pits one of the four ritual missions from the book. And neither player selects Tac Ops because you're only focused on the primary mission. The winner of this map wins the ritual victory, but the Inquisitor does win on a tie. And keep in mind, you can use your bonuses you've gained throughout the game in this mission. Depending on which team wins this condition, there are four possible outcomes from the campaign, and you can read those in the back of the rulebook. If you are playing a Spec Ops narrative game, this is the conclusion of the Spec Ops. You can pick two rewards from the following list. And if you won the Control Victory, then pick an extra one. And if you won the Ritual Mission, pick another one here as well. And you can select the same reward multiple times. I'll have them listed on the screen, but I won't be reading them off. I'll put all these slides into a PDF that you can download in the description. In Games Workshop does have a one-page cheat sheet in the back of the rulebook, so I'll make my version of that and attach it as a one-page reference as well, so you can download that and print that out. 
If you have any questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability down in the comments. Thank you for watching.